Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Great crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and addressed them. If anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you, wishing to construct a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if there is enough for its completion? Otherwise, after laying the foundation and finding himself unable to finish the work, the onlookers should laugh at him and say, this one began to build but did not have the resources to finish. Or what king, marching into battle, would not first sit down and decide whether, with 10,000 troops, he can successfully oppose another king advancing upon him with 20,000 troops. But if not, while he is still far away, he will send a delegation to ask for peace terms. In the same way, any one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of those gospels where the first thing that the priest or deacon has to do when he's preaching on it is reassure people he doesn't really mean this, okay? When Jesus says, no one can come after me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, we just kind of immediately look for a way to turn that down to walk it back and talk about, well, that's the kind of the way that the people of his day talk, kind of an exaggeration. Making, to make the point, you say more than what is really on target and you just kind of, everybody knows to kind of turn it back and dial it down a bit. Fine, I can play that game too. We can all here recognize that what Jesus is saying is not in the normal way of talking. I'm not sure that that helps us very much, however. What he is talking about is what one of the great writers of the 20th century, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lost his life in his opposition to, his, um, not to the Nazi regime, regime that had taken over his country, called the, the title of his greatest book is called The Cost of Discipleship. The cost of discipleship is pretty clearly the, uh, the theme of Bonhoeffer's book and the, th the idea comes from this gospel or any one of several others like it that are scattered throughout all four. What is the cost of discipleship? It's everything. It's not a part of what you have, it's not a tithe, it's not a percentage which we could set sometimes lower and sometimes higher. Jesus makes it very clear, even if the language is exaggerated, that the cost of discipleship is nothing less than everything. Everything that is yours, everything that you hold dear, everything that you value, Everything that you have possessed or that you want to possess, all of your possessions, present or future, all of them is what the cost of discipleship is. He gives us these lines and at the very end, just in case we have missed the point, he summarizes it and he says, any one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. Is he serious? And the answer is, of course he's serious. And if we wanna know how serious he is, we got a perfect example coming at us from our second reading. Philemon has a problem, and the problem is the letter that he has just received from the Apostle Paul. Most of Paul's letters are not written to individuals, they are written from our experience of our own history. 
Nevertheless, a slave did have a master, and Onesimus, who is the one referred to here by name as a slave, was one of Philemon's slave. Philemon was the master, Onesimus was the slave, until Onesimus ran off. Where did he go? Well, he obviously ran into Paul, and Paul describes himself here as a man who is a prisoner for Christ Jesus. We know that Paul was a prisoner for an extended period of time twice, once in Palestine and once in Rome, the last imprisonment that preceded his death. Because he describes himself as now an old man, which is to say someone who is close to death, the assumption is that Paul is writing from the city of Rome, the capital of the empire, which makes good sense as a place where he might run into not just this particular runaway slave, but maybe a lot of them. If you are a slave and you have decided to run away, where are you going to go? You are not going to go where it is going to be easy for you to be found and easy to be recognized and captured. You're going to go to the big cities. You're going to go to a place where there are tons of people where you can kind of blend in. Remember, there is no racial stigma attached to this. Everybody looks like you. If you can learn the language fast enough, you can just kind of become a fish in the water with all of the other fishes, and it becomes much more difficult to be recognized as a slave, to be captured and return to your master. So Onesimus in Rome runs into Paul. He hears Paul's preaching. Paul, as a prisoner in Rome, was not kept in a jail. We would call it more house arrest. And people were able to visit him, even large groups of people who were able to hear him preach, which is apparently what Onesimus does. And he is convinced by the words of Paul about the gospel of Christ. And Paul baptizes him. He refers to Onesimus as the one whose father I have become in my imprisonment. That is not referring to natural fatherhood, but to spiritual fatherhood. Paul has become Onesimus' father by being the one who baptized him into the body of Christ. So far, so good for Onesimus and also for Paul, because it turns out that Onesimus has been very helpful to Paul. If you take a look at the citation for this scripture reading in your worship aids, you can see that one verse has been left out, verse 11, and that in that verse, Paul makes a pun, a pun on the name Onesimus. Onesimus means in Greek, useful, which is not a name that any mother would dare to give her child, but is a typical name that somebody might give a slave who needed a new name since most slaves were prisoners of war and most wars were conducted against different groups of barbarians, other tribes, other languages. When somebody was captured and entered into slavery, very often they were given a new name that fit more the language of the slave owners. And Onesimus, a name that means useful, Paul says in that verse 11 that we don't have here, once upon a time, he was not very useful either to you or to me, but now he is useful to us both. But I don't want to force you on this. This man has been a help to me, but he belongs to you. And so I am sending him back to you with this letter. And I am urging you to receive him back, not as a runaway slave, but as a brother in Christ. It's at this point that we begin to see Philemon's problem. Slavery was a common institution in the ancient world and everybody knew the rules and everybody knew that when a slave ran away and was captured and brought back, he was to be punished. It might be physical punishment. It would certainly involve a scarring of the cheek or the ear to mark him as a runaway of slaves so that henceforward he would be recognizable as one who had run away before. And there were other punishments, harsher or softer, that could be laid upon him. Except that Paul doesn't want Philemon to do any of that. He wants Philemon to, re to recognize that Onesimus is not what he was before. Before, he was simply a slave in Philemon's squadron of slaves. A slave is indeed, as Aristotle described them, a living tool. 
A slave is not a person in his own right. A slave is a living tool in the hand of his owner who directs him to do whatever it is that the owner wants done. But Paul insists that Onesimus, because he is now baptized, because he now shares the same faith as Philemon, because they both belong to the body of Christ, Philemon cannot, recognize, cannot receive him back just as a runaway slave, a useful tool, a living tool that has been returned to the toolkit. He must receive him back as a brother in the Lord. And it's at this point that we begin to see Philemon's problem. It's at this point that we recognize that what Jesus says at the end of today's gospel is not an exaggeration at all. You must be willing to give up, to surrender everything that you have, everything that you are, if you are going to be my disciple. Because Philemon's whole way of life is now trembling. It is now shaking. It is about to collapse. Is it possible to receive back as a brother in Christ, a slave, and still keep him as a slave? How is that going to work? How are you going to arrange things so that this man who was a living tool for you before is now a brother in Christ? How is he going to resume his previous state and just go on as things had been before? Is that possible? It's not perhaps impossible. There are ways that we could imagine they might make it work, but it certainly is not the normal way of looking either at slavery or at the relationship between baptized members of the Church of Christ. And so Philemon now has a problem. What is he going to do with this man? He shows up, returned voluntarily, and he has in his hand a letter from the Apostle Paul recommending a very precise, very specific, very uncomfortable way of action to Philemon. What is he going to do? We don't know what he did. We don't have any kind of a response from Philemon to Paul that answers any of those questions. Maybe Philemon just received him back the way anybody would receive back a runaway slave, treated him the same way, maybe made the punishments less harsh than they would normally be, but put him back exactly as he was before. Or maybe Philemon actually freed Onesimus. Paul indicates that he would actually like to have Onesimus back. He would actually like to have him back so that he continue helping Paul in his ministry as a prisoner of Christ in the capital city. Maybe Philemon sent Onesimus back, either newly freed or still a slave, but now turned over to Paul as the new owner, as a gift. We have no idea what happened. We have no idea how Philemon responded, and that's probably good for us. Because we can imagine all of the different ways that somebody like Philemon might respond to this kind of a challenge. And in doing that, thinking about what maybe it meant for him and maybe what he actually did a long, long time ago, we can recognize that very often, maybe more often than we would like to admit most days, Philemon's problem is our problem. Not because we own slaves and have to figure out what to do with it, but because occasionally, maybe more often than occasionally, situations arise in our station of life, in our way of living, in which everybody is doing one thing, everybody expects us to do that thing, and all of a sudden we recognize that maybe not. Maybe there is something in this normal practice or this normal attitude or this normal way of thinking that everybody has signed on for. Maybe there's something in it that doesn't quite fit with the gospel of Christ. Maybe there is something in it that we cannot go along with. Maybe there is something here that we have to separate ourselves from, that we have to rethink and maybe re-engage in a totally different way. When Jesus says that the only one who can be his disciple is the one who renounces all his possessions, he's making it clear that really everything is up for grabs. Everything is up for reevaluation. Everything has to be looked at with fresh and new eyes in the light of the gospel. And that is not something that we can do once and for all in our youth and forget it for the rest of our lives. That is something that all of us are gonna to have to do on a pretty regular basis, routinely. 
That is why the church places such emphasis on the sacrament of confession and even more on that examination of conscience that is supposed to precede every good confession. An honest look at ourselves with fresh eyes that are willing not just to go along with what we have always done, just assuming it can't be changed, but to look at what we are doing in the normal patterns of our life, whether they are economic or social or civil or involving our duties as citizenship, look at the normal things we do with fresh eyes and ask ourselves whether or not it fits with the gospel. And if it doesn't, then maybe we have to make a change. Sometimes those changes are very slow and very painfully arrived at. We have the letter of Paul to Philemon here, almost at the very beginning of Christianity, how many hundreds of years, how many centuries did it take before the church recognized universally that in fact it is not possible to hold as a slave a brother in Christ or even another fellow human being. It was painful, it was slow, but eventually we got there, and so the church becomes a kind of champion for freedom and a champion against slavery, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries, and especially in South America, but in other parts of the world as well. It takes a while. That may be the case with us as we go about our individual way of responding to the gospel of Christ and taking to heart and meditating upon Philemon's problem. And as we do so, we should recognize that what Jesus is demanding in today's gospel is not unreasonable. It may sound extreme, and certainly the language is extreme, but it's really not unusual because it has a backstory, it has a background. Who in their right mind demands everything of somebody else? The only person who can demand everything of someone is a person who has first given everything to that other person. Jesus can demand all of our possessions, all that we are, because he has first given himself to us in that way. He has called us into being. Our very existence is a gift from him, and the giving of himself does not stop with our creation. It continues in the very giving of himself that is total and complete, the perfect sacrifice of himself that he makes once and for all on the cross, but that continues to be present to us in the gift of the Eucharist. It is here every Sunday that once again Christ gives us everything that he is. His very body and his blood, his soul and divinity, all that he possesses, all that he is, is handed over to us, put into our hands as we take it into ourselves, as we absorb it into us, or as it absorbs us into it. Jesus gives us everything and therefore he not only demands everything, it's not really much in the form of a commandment here. What it is is awakening in us the love that wants to do the same. When somebody loves us so much that they give us everything, there is an almost automatic instinctive response to want to do the same for them, to give them back in return everything that we are. When we want to know how Jesus gets off, commanding this of us, we don't have to look any farther than this altar and what happens to it throughout the course of this celebration. The ordinary bread and wine become very extraordinary body and blood of Christ. He continues to give himself to us. Everything he has, he gives to us. And he also gives us the opportunity then of giving back to him everything that we have and everything that we have.